Well, colleagues, friends, a uh, very warm welcome to our third seminar on science for the green economy. Thank you for your coming. My name is Simon Pollard. I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor at Cranfield University for Energy, Environment and Agri-Food and your host for this evening. So our, our seminar series, uh, put, put, uh, put on in jointly with Herbert Smith Freehills, mm -hmm. attempts to give a, an authoritative technology and management voice to the green economy debate with a smattering of law, of course, along the way. You will all recognise this evening's topic, water stress, as an issue of rapidly growing prominence across the business world, domestic government policy, and international development, of course. And of course, addressing the issue of water stress requires a combination of technology and management solutions, of course, as do all issues, really, associated with uh, the green economy set, of course, within a complex legal framework. And so in keeping with our, uh, our series with Herbert Smith, I'm delighted to invite, uh, to, to, to welcome the speakers this afternoon. Uh, Dr. Jerry Knox is our reader in agricultural water management and will speak on water for food and in particular aspects of uh, water footprinting. Professor Elise Cartmel is Cranfield's Director of Environmental Technology an environmental chemist and technologist managing our water science, risk and sustainable design capability at Cranfield. And Julie Vaughan, of course, is our partner at Herbert Smith Freehills, um, closely associated with the uh, environmental law practice, of course, a specialist in natural resource law and oil and gas in particular, but will this evening speak on water law for us. So the format of our, uh, our evening is, is, is the same as usual, one of short, sharp summaries and then I'll, I'll, I will chair a QA and a and we'll be delighted if you will uh, stay afterwards to enjoy some refreshment with us. We don't expect a fire alarm, I'm told. If it does go off, it's a loud continuous bell. It's down the stairs quickly. Uh, and with that, can I introduce Jerry to give the first summary? Jerry. Thank you, Simon, and uh, thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for coming along. And, of course, thank you, Julie, for inviting me here um, to HSF this evening um, as part of this Science of the Green Economy um, seminar series. And what I'd like to do with, um, with you tonight for the next um, 20 minutes is to share with you some of my thoughts that relate to um, mitigating water stress in the context of water for food. Now... Um, I think water for food is gradually rising up the agenda and starting to take uh, centre stage in terms of our awareness of the risks um, that we're facing as we go forward as a society. Not only energy, but food and water are in the mix as well. So what I'd like to do is focus on three um, particular questions. The first is, how much water do we actually eat? Secondly, um, what is the colour of water and why is that important? And finally, why do these two aspects relate to a green economy and what are the implications of those two in terms of going forward and trying to grow more food in an increasingly constrained world? Now, in 2010, the, the then government chief scientist, um, Sir John Beddington, warned governments and society of what he called the, the perfect storm. And this was a converging of externalities or pressures on our natural resource base, driven by a, a growing population with changing dietary habits, undergoing relatively swift socioeconomic development, and living in an environment that was increasingly uncertain with regard to the climate. Um, now, the perfect storm of course received a lot of attention uh, around 2010 but Sir John highlighted and singled out water for food and water for people as two key areas requiring concerted action. Now my talk will focus on the former and then Elise will follow up and uh, focus on the latter. But let's just briefly think about why did Sir John raise this concern about water for food? Well, the reason is, is that to grow any particular um, food crop, whether it's a fresh fruit or vegetable, or whether it's a processed um, agricultural commodity, requ requires a lot of water. 
And that um, we can demonstrate with uh, this uh, simple schematic, which I'd like to take you through the virtual water flows or the embedded water uh, that is implicit in growing a burger, producing a burger from field to fork. Now, um, most of the agriculture in the UK and indeed uh, internationally is rain-fed. Uh, it relies on what we call green water. Um, but in addition to uh, relying on grassland to produce um, uh, outputs for a livestock system, um, there are also significant inputs in terms of feedstock and the, the main component there is wheat. So wheat is used as a, an over, overwintering feedstock and of course those products then feed into the livestock system. But a lot of that wheat um, in the arid and semi-arid parts of the world is not dependent on uh, green water or rain-fed agriculture but actually requires uh, large inputs of what we call blue water in terms of supplemental irrigation. Now as our um, commodity moves through the supply chain, um, even in the, the livestock system there are um, volumes of water required for drinking and for cleaning and animal husbandry, um, but all of that is now coming from what we call blue water, uh, domestic mains water supply. Um, all through this system we're starting to get um, uh, volumes of water becoming embedded in the product um, as we enter the final part of the, the processing where um, the meat is prepared, processed and packed, ready for distribution. And again, um, still uh, more inputs of blue water, albeit less, um, to, till we get to the stage where we have our end product. Now these blue and green water inputs um, are direct, um, but in addition to that, we also have indirect water inputs in the form of electricity uh, and fertilizer because we need a lot of water for cooling of electricity and we need a lot of water to produce the fertilizer. So we can start to see that there are an awful lot of virtual water flows involved in getting a product from primary production through the supply chain to the consumer. Now, if we, if we look at some examples of commodities that we tend to rely on each and every day, um, the data here is showing the volume of water that is um, contained, the virtual water content contained within a kilogram of, of the products. And what we can see is that for most of the, the fresh fruit and vegetables, it's around 100, 100 litres to produce a kilogram of fresh, fresh produce. If we start to look at some of the other commodities where the chain is much longer, the, the, the food production chain involves growing a crop and then putting it through an animal and then converting it into an agricultural commodity, then we can see that the water, the virtual water content is significantly higher. Um, I'd just briefly like to reflect on the, the humble potato because um, it used to be a, a staple crop in the UK. Um, it is in decline. But it's just worth bearing in mind, you might have wondered why there is a wheelie bin out in the foyer. Um, well, to produce a two and a half kilogram bag of potatoes requires around 250 litres of water. So next time you're shopping, maybe reflect on the amount of water that has been embedded in that product. But if we start to look at some of the other commodities, um, particularly beef and livestock and dairying, then the numbers become exceptionally high. 18,000 litres to produce a kilogram of beef. That's 4,000 litres to produce a burger. Um, so that's 2,500 of those green bottles uh, out in the, in the reception there. So we start to get a measure of the amount of water that is embedded in the food that we're eating. And I think the issue is, is that we're eating this food without really understanding uh, the environmental impact uh, that this water is having. Now I mentioned in that earlier schematic, I referred to blue water and green water. Well, um, green water we refer to as being rainfall and most agriculture depends on rain-fed agriculture. It has a low opportunity cost. So if it isn't falling on agricultural land, it will be falling on semi-natural or natural habitats. There's very little we can do to divert the rainfall to alternative uses. However, if we think about blue water, blue water is the water that's being abstracted from our, 
our freshwater ground, groundwater and surface resources, and that has a, a very high opportunity cost. And indeed, when we start thinking about water scarcity, water stress, um, all of that discussion is around blue water. It's around blue water scarcity. Uh, and indeed, the competing uses between agriculture, industry, uh, people, and to maintain environmental flows, it's all about the blue water. Now, I'd just like to um, show this as an example of um, why the colour of water is important. Because if we take two commodities, uh, a regular bag of M&M chocolate and a jar of Dolmio pasta sauce, hopefully which you're quite familiar with, if we look at the, um, the overall virtual water content in each of these two commodities, we can see that actually the M&Ms appear to have a tenfold greater water content. But if we then disaggregate that data and break it into blue and green water, we can see that actually they both have an almost identical blue water component. So we have to be very careful about talking about water footprints, about virtual water, because it's the blue water element that is, is important. And I think this is probably the main reason why supermarkets have avoided uh, going down the, the eco-labeling for water footprinting, because it would be very difficult to try and explain on the front of a packet of crisps or uh, a bag of produce the difference between blue and green water uh, and its respective impacts on the environment. Um, but it's worth just um, bearing that in mind. Now, those are obviously just two very separate commodities, but what about the UK diet as a whole? Well, this is based on research from Cranfield where we've looked at the total amount of food that is being produced um, within our shores, within the UK. We've looked at the amount of water, amount of produce that is coming, uh, being imported. And we've looked at all those commodities and their relative blue and green components to try and work out, once we divide that by the population, what the total virtual water content is of our diet. And the figures here are represented to show that, that um, each and every day um, we are consuming around 2,500 litres per capita per day. Um, that doesn't reflect a particularly meat-heavy diet or particularly uh, vegetable-based diet. It's an aggregate of everything we eat in the country. So that's the bad news, is that it's, it's 2,500 litres per day. The good news is that um, the vast majority of that is actually green water. That's our low opportunity cost water. It's the rain-fed element of production. And so that is a, a good, a good, a good take-home story, that um, what we're eating um, potentially doesn't have such a big impact, impact on the environment. However, there is a, there is a, a, a caution Let's just briefly look at this 160 litres blue water that we're consuming every day. And let's very quickly put it in context with the amount of water that we use in the home. Now, um, data from uh, our consumption of water in the home for washing, cleaning, um, bathing, etc., cetera, um, suggests that we use around 150 litres per day. <coughs> so that's our blue water consumption in the home and it's almost exactly the same as the blue water consumption that we're eating. Um, but there is a very, very important difference between uh, these two numbers, and that is that the water for, that we use in the home is predominantly non-consumptive. We use the water, we, we then return it back into the system, and if you look on your water bills, you will see that you're paying for 90% of that water to be taken away, to be cleaned, treated and made re-available for use. However, um, in terms of the blue water use in agriculture, that is almost entirely consumptive. We can't recover any of the water that we've consumed in the products. So this has a very important bearing when we're thinking about the green economy and measures to try and improve water efficiency, trying to improve our understanding of water uh, in society, that we mustn't just think about our water use in the home but we must also think about the blue water component of what we're eating. Now, the blue water element, of course, is um, the next question is, is well, where does that water come from? Um, and are we importing water from parts of the world 
that may be under severe water stress. This is some data from the World Resources Institute where they've combined an assessment of fresh water availability, that, that's blue water, and they've correlated that against uh, blue water abstractions for industry, for people, uh, and, in, and agriculture. And they've identified a series of hotspots around the world where there is an imbalance between freshwater availability and demand. And these are highlighted by the red areas in Australia, the Middle East, parts of Southeast Asia, the Mediterranean Basin, Southern Africa, um, and parts of Mexico and Latin America. But of course, in our mind is, well, where are we importing two thirds of our fresh produce that we're eating each and every day? And so research from Cranfield has tried to quantify that impact by looking at the top 10 commodities. Uh, so shown on the left are the, the top 10 commodities that we import um, into our national diet. And you don't need to worry too much about the numbers. These are the, the virtual water contents of those commodities. Um, but what is important is where those commodities are being sourced from. So we can see that, for example, rice, it has a blue water uh, content uh, of 0.43. We don't actually grow any rice in the UK yet, um, but all of it is imported from Spain and India, which themselves are under um, high and extreme high water stress. So in effect, we could be exporting drought from these parts of the world. Similarly, for fruit and vegetables and for uh, wine, again, we're importing these uh, fresh produce from areas that are already currently water stressed. And that preceding map um, is for the current situation. It ignores the effect of climate change. It ignores the effect of uh, a growing population. And it doesn't counter for any change in the balance between availability and supply. If we look at um, some of the commodities such as, um, I'm not sure we eat too much goat meat, but certainly lamb and beef, um, we can see that the blue water content is quite low, and that's because it's largely um, dependent on green water. And we're getting most of our produce from the slightly wetter, the humid and temperate parts of the world, New Zealand, the UK, and Ireland. Um, so there is, a, there, is a good, there is a good message there. The problem comes when we start growing, rearing livestock, which have very high virtual blue water contents in arid parts of the world. So rearing livestock in Texas, uh, rearing livestock in Australia, this is where we start to create major problems in terms of our, our blue water content. Now, I suppose until now, I've really focused on the U a UK-centric perspective. Um, how much water do we eat? What, uh, what components um, are within that? Um, and how much is embedded within our diet? But we need to remember, of course, that uh, water risks uh, and the link with food is a, particularly, um, it's a particularly strong global issue at the minute. And the World Economic Forum, in their assessment of 41 uh, societal, economic, technical, geopolitical um, risks, have identified uh, water crises and food crises as being right up there in the top of the mix second only to uh, major systemic fiscal failure. So there is a, there is a gradual dawning that uh, food and water crises um, are a problem uh, and they're here to stay. Uh, their assessment of the impact of um, the risk and the likelihood of the, uh, the risk um, is over the next decade. And if we look at the last um, six or seven years worth of data from the World Economic Forum, we can see that water supply um, has emerged very rapidly into the lens of, of global world risks. And, and the question is, is, well, why has that happened? Well, I think the obvious is probably quite clear. There is a gradual realization that the world population is growing, um, this changing dietary habits is driving a shift away from a dependence on, gra on uh, pulses and rice to grains, the hard grains, and a much higher meat-based diet. Uh, so much so that in the next decade, uh, estimates are that uh, food demand for meat will increase by about 25% over and above baseline levels. 
So that gives you a flavour of um, the magnitude of the problem that we may be facing, that we need to try and uh, grow more food with less water. And as Sir John Beddington said um, four years ago, we need a green revolution, only we need it to be greener and we need it in half the time. So, um, so really to, to summarise, um, what are the messages for a green economy and trying to get society, uh, multinationals, business to buy into a green economy um, from a water perspective? Well, I think we need to be uh, mindful of the fact that um, we're consuming as much water, blue water, in our diet as we're using in the home. So we need to be very uh, aware of that. We also need to be careful about um, where we're importing our food from and there's a, a, a gradual realisation that um, retailers and uh, uh, food processors are aware that their supply chains may be at risk from importing food from parts of the world, North Africa, the Mediterranean Basin, uh, that are not only subject to severe water stress, but are also um, particularly at risk from geopolitical instability. And then finally, I think there are reputational risks to to UK and international businesses in terms of uh, the credibility of relying on their supply chains, um, taking food and produce from these parts of the world. There is a different argument about supporting rural livelihoods and benefiting the rural, rural poor. I don't think that is in question, but we have to, have to look at this in a balanced way and say, well, we need to have development that is environmentally sustainable and we need to make sure that we're not exporting and exacerbating a problem that already exists. So what can we do about um, this pending problem? Well, a lot of people say the obvious solution is to change our diet and to reduce the proportion of beef and meat in our diet. Uh, that would have an immediate impact on the virtual water content. Well, yes, it would, but it would actually have the wrong impact because most of that water is green water. We would simply be taking uh, green water out of our total diet and impacting on businesses uh, that are operating in humid and temperate parts of the world producing beef. The corollary is that we would increase our dependence on fresh fruit and vegetables which we've seen has a high blue water content and we would uh, inadvertently add pressure onto the existing supply chains um, and increase our, our blue water uh, footprint if you like um, beyond our shores. So we have to be very careful about swinging diets um, for, for well-being and health. Yes, it makes sense, but we have to be very careful about the water impact of changing our diet. The second aspect is reducing food waste, and that makes a lot of sense. We're throwing away about 250 litres per person per day in our food, and that's mainly within the perishable fruit and vegetables that have short shelf life and it makes sense to try and um, re reduce our waste in the food supply chain because that would not only reduce water use but it would also have a direct impact on energy and reduce our carbon footprint so I'm, I'm convinced that reducing food waste is a is a very sensible and rational way to go forward and then uh, sorry finally uh, one other option there's a lot of discussion internationally about particularly in sub-saharan africa trying to get um, productivity up, trying to reduce the, what we call the yield gap, um, getting um, African and developing countries' productivity up nearer to its potential yield. And I think there is an opportunity there, but again, it needs to be managed very carefully, and we need to balance this technology management, and certainly GM crops will have a role to play there um, in terms of increasing productivity. And then I think finally there is an educational message here um, that I think water has been outside the radar of society and businesses for far too long and we need to try and get water into the minds of people. And there's a lovely statue here of uh, Fonsky. He's sitting in, in a square in, in Leuven and um, pouring water into the mind. And I think that really sums up what we should be trying to do in a green economy is getting water into our minds, recognising the value of water to um, society uh, and trying to take a balanced view in terms of sustainable development.
And then just finally to thank the colleagues who have contributed a lot of um, the data and information to this research. Uh, my colleague Tim Hess is the, the author of much of this work and is leading the vanguard um, as far as the UK is concerned on understanding our water um, footprint, um, but also the many companies and corporations and stakeholders that have kindly contributed data and time to our work. Thank you. Well, Jerry, thank you very much. You've set that up very nicely indeed for our next presentation from Elise. Uh, water for people. Whilst you're getting ready there, Elise, I should have also welcomed, I didn't earlier, I apologise, our Vice Chancellor and Chief Executive, uh, Sir Professor uh, Peter Gregson. Elise, over to you, Water for People. Okay, well, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to speak to you this evening. Uh, and so far, we've had a great explanation about the challenges uh, with regards to the supply of water for food, uh, both currently and into the future. And we know uh, that there's are conflicting demands on that water uh, use. We need it as well for industry and for people. And I'd like now just to spend some time to highlight some of the challenges surrounding uh, the supply of water uh, for people, and then to look at some of the solutions that there might be in terms of uh, water treatment and sanitation treatment uh, going forwards. So what are some of the issues internationally? <coughs> well, in the next five seconds of my talk, the world's urban population will increase by 10 people. And these people need decent, safe, reliable uh, sources of water and also sanitation uh, treatment technologies. Now, this puts a huge pressure on uh, city service agencies uh, and government and it really makes it vitally important that we find some solutions into these into the future. So I'd like just to show you uh, a video that kind of explains this uh, more succinctly uh, than I can and highlights and puts some of the th issues into context. Poop. Doo doo. Number two. Caca. Crap. Shit. There's a ton of it and dozens of words to describe it. But for 2.6 billion people around the globe, there's no place to actually do it. Imagine that, no reliable sanitary toilet. What would you do? Well, what you have to do, use anything you can find, which means in no time, you've got a big pile of problems, like diseases deadly diseases that are filling half the hospital beds in developing countries. A serious, well, crappy scenario that by working in partnership, we can change. How? By doing something that hasn't been done for centuries, reinventing the toilet. The flush toilet, as you and I know it, requires a massive amount of sewer infrastructure and immense amounts of water. Two things increasingly hard to come by. Now is the time to eliminate the health hazards recycle waste, and turn crap into valuable resources like clean burning fuel, fertilizer, and believe it or not, fresh water. Today, our toilets can't do that, but the toilet of tomorrow can. Reinventing the toilet. Let's get our feet together and do it. So really here what we've been finding out is in terms of the vast numbers of people without proper access to sanitation and also we'll hear later about Cranfield's uh, solution uh, to the reinvent the toilet challenge. But it's not just about sanitation, there's also over 780 million people without access to improved sources of drinking water. And a lot of that is very acute uh, in rural areas uh, in the developing world. Some of the issues surrounding water supply are...